nights when the dark lasts a little bit longer. When the wind and the storm is a little bit stronger. When the fear in my heart digs a little bit deeper. When my faith just stands a little bit weaker. Where could I run to? Where could I go? Even when it feels like my world is shaking, even when I've had all that I can take, I know you never let me go. Whoa. And even when the waters won't stop rising, even when I'm caught in the dead of the night, I know no matter how big it is, you're with me. Good morning, church. Welcome to the house of the Lord. Can I get you all to stand with me? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to lift up, before we get started, if you would all agree with me in prayer for our children, our Kiki here on the island. We have been hearing lots of stories of kidnappings and runaways and stuff that is just pure evil. And so let's, let's uh, take advantage of our corporate time together and let's pray for our children. You can just, in your mind, extend a hand and just lift up the children you know. Dear Heavenly Father, we just lift up our babies to you, God. We pray a hedge of protection around each and every one that's on this island. They belong to you, God, and you love them more than we ever could. We ask together, Lord, that you would keep them safe. Keep evil from coming near our door. We bind the devil in the name of Jesus. You must go in the name of Jesus. Get off of our island. Get your hands off of our children. We pray and declare right now for safety. We decree and declare right now that children will come home, Lord that they will see the love of their home and come home. I pray you strengthen the homes, Jesus. Strengthen the mothers and fathers and aunties and uncles. Strengthen them, Lord, so that they can provide protection and love that's needed. And Lord, we just thank you. Thank you for this morning where we can dwell in your house, God. Holy Spirit, I pray you go through each person that's here and you ignite them with your fire, Lord. Ignite them in the name of Jesus. Go through this house, row by row, person by person. Ignite them, Lord. Put your tongues of fire on their heads. Let them prophesy, Lord. We invite you here, Holy Spirit. We ask for your glory to fall. We are hungry for you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for letting us come in your house and have an opportunity to worship you. We thank you, God. We thank you in your son, Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah. If you want to greet somebody real quick that's next to you, we're going to get started. Hallelujah. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Through you, I can do anything. I can do all things Cause it's you who gives me strength Nothing is impossible Through you blinders are open Strongholds are broken I am living by faith Nothing is impossible Down now. 
our trust in your name, Jesus. We're nothing to fear, you are here with us. Yes, we put a hope in your name, Jesus. Blessing and honor, blessing and honor, glory and power unto our God forever and ever. All of the honor. All of the praise is yours, yours forever. We praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our God, he reigns.
sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer, come home. You're not too
want you to come forward we're just gonna I feel like in the presence of the Lord right now we're supposed to do this if you need prayer just come and we're just gonna pray for you and we're gonna go on with our service so if there's anybody that needs prayer for anything in your life just come this is the time to do it just stay in this attitude of worship right now we're in the presence of the Lord just stay in this attitude stay in this attitude she Lord are broken, God. That the power of sin is broken, Lord, from our lives, God. It's in your presence, God. That, Lord, that you make changes, Lord, for eternity, God, in our lives. You heal, you set free, you deliver, God. And so, Lord, today we, we acknowledge, Lord, your presence, God. We acknowledge, Lord, you being here and thanking you for that, God. And Lord, we ask that you would meet the needs, God, that are represented, Lord, by the individuals that stand here today, that call out to you, Lord, that have come in faith, God, knowing, God, that not only can you meet this need, God, but you will meet this need, Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, whether it be a physical healing, God, in their bodies, Lord, right now, in Jesus' name, in your presence, Lord, we ask that you touch, God, and heal, Lord, set free, Lord, from addictions, God, and Lord, break bondages, God, of sin, Father, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, the things that so easily beset us and separate us, God, from you. Lord, we ask that you would step into the middle of our situation, God, and redeem us from those things, God, in Jesus' name. Touch, God. 
Lord, by your power, God, by the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit in this place, even now, God, do that work, God. In Jesus' name, God. God, we need you, Lord. We need you, God. Lord, we don't want to try to do this without you, God. We need you, God. Fill this temple, God. Fill this temple, Lord, with your presence, Father God. acknowledge that it's good to be in your presence it's good to be here and this is a good place God thank you for that thank you for showing up today thank you for this open heaven God that we're sensing even right now Father in Jesus name thank you Lord Lord we we plead your blood we plead your blood Lord over the remainder of the service and we cancel the assignments of the enemy where he would try to distract and where he would try to come in and cause us to cause our train of thought to go somewhere else Lord help us to be caught up in this in this moment God caught up in your presence here Father and speak to us Father in Jesus name speak to us God we thank you God that Lord that you love us more than anything you gave your life for us Redeemed us, Lord. Yes. You call us your children. Yes. You love us. We're called according to your purpose. And you will complete that which you began in us, God, until the day of Christ Jesus. Father, we give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, worship team. Wonderful job. Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, let's give that worship team a great hand here. Just want to do a good job. I just want to open with a passage of scripture that's not up there, so if you're looking for it, you aren't going to find it. Um, if you have your Bibles, it's in Second Chronicles chapter 7. It's what the Lord laid on my heart this morning and kind of did here this morning already. Second uh, Chronicles chapter 7 verse 1, Solomon is, is dedicating the temple. He's, his father had gathered all the materials, the gold and the wood and everything that he was going to need to build the temple. He David couldn't build the temple, the Bible says, because he had shed too much blood. And God ordained Solomon to build the temple, so Solomon builds the temple according to God's direction and measurement, and, and the temple's finished now, so he's getting ready to dedicate the temple. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1, it says, When Solomon finished praying, fire flashed down from heaven, and burn up the offering and the sacrifices and the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glorious presence of the Lord filled it. When all the people saw the fire coming down from the glorious presence of the Lord filling the temple, they fell on their face on the ground and worshiped and praised the Lord saying, He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Amen. Verse 12 says, And one night the Lord appeared to Solomon and said, I've heard your prayer, and I've chosen this temple as a place to make sacrifices. Listen to this. At times I might shut up heaven so that no rain falls or command grasshoppers to devour your crops or send plagues among you. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins and I'll restore their land. Amen. My eyes will be open 
And my ears attentive to the prayers made in this place, for I have chosen this temple to be set apart, to be holy, to be a place where my name will be honored forever. And I will always watch over it, for it is dear to my heart. Father, thank you for filling this temple today, Lord, with your presence. We thank you that you have come this morning, and Lord, I believe that you want to speak to us. And and Lord, we do humble ourselves, and we do sense that, that those plagues have been released on the earth, and the grasshoppers, the locusts uh, that, that move through Africa even today as we speak. Lord, the things that you just mentioned here are taking place, Lord, in our country, and it's because, God, we've turned our back on you. We've turned our back on you, and God, and, and Lord, we've allowed idols and we've allowed sin to come into our lives and lord and we humble ourselves today and we ask you to forgive us we ask lord that you would cleanse us god as we turn from our wicked ways and lord and we look to you father lord as the answer god and as the one who would rescind god who is the one who would take away that plague god the one who would take away that grasshopper father god in jesus name and lord you said that you would hear our prayers in this place and lord that you're presence would fill the temple god that's what we're asking for lord we're not asking for large crowds we're not asking for finances we're asking for your presence god to come in jesus name and move lord let us when we leave this place god let us know god that we've been in your presence today in jesus name We've always uh, we've always been taught that the biggest thief of of the best that God has for us is to simply settle for something that's good. Elijah calls down pro, uh, fire from God, kills four hundred and fifty false prophets of Baal, and four hundred. False prophets, 850 in total. He sees God move in, in miraculous ways. At one time, he pronounces a, a curse on Israel because of Ahab and Jezebel, because Ahab being the most wicked king that Israel ever had, and, and Jezebel, his wife, basically running the show and Elijah shows up and says, listen, it's not going to rain again until I say it's going to rain. Because of your sin, because of what you're allowing to take place. The Bible says that he left there and he went by a brook called Kedron. And for three years, God supernaturally provided for Elijah. For three years, the brook Kedron ran right by uh, Elijah while, while Israel was in a complete drought where there was no water, there was no rain, there was, there, there was, there was no moisture Elijah laid down by this brook Kedron, and, and every day he drank from fresh water from this brook. And the Bible says that God provided meat for him every day and bread for him every day by, by birds that would come and, and, and bring his meals. So he, he lived in supernatural provision for three years. And then one day the Bible says that the book dried up. You know why? Because the brook wasn't the best that God had for Elijah. He moves him from there where it seems like he was going to a worse place. He goes to a widow who's getting ready to die. Making, when, he, when he meets her, he, she's making her last meal, and she's, she has, she's gathering some sticks to, to cook this last meal for her and her son, and they had given up hope that they were, they were going to live after this, that they were, they'd already set in their mind that they were going to die. And Elijah said, look, if you will be obedient to God, if you prepare something for me first and then, and then for your for yourself afterwards, you will live out the rest of this drought without any problem. There's going to be oil in your, in your, in your uh, jars, and there'll be, there'll be meal in your, in your cupboard. And you're going to have everything that you need. God is going to provide for it. And, and she was obedient to do. Come on. She was obedient to do what 
But that still wasn't the best that God had for Elijah. I think the best that God had for Elijah was just that he didn't taste death. That Elijah was swept up, the Bible says, in a chariot of fire and taken to heaven. I, I, I believe we're going to see Elijah again. I believe he's going to be one of those prophets that come back in the book of Revelation. That's not what I'm talking about today. The biggest thief, the biggest thief of the best that God has for us is that when we see something that's good and we settle for it. I, I wouldn't want to be up here and try to preach at all without the anointing of the Holy Spirit. But I think sometimes what happens is this, is if we can just be honest, that we... We have the anointing. We sense the anointing. When we come to church, there's an anointing on the worship, and, and there's, there's, you know, there's an anointing on the message. There, there's an anointing on me as I'm delivering the message, but what happens is this, is that we leave with just the anointing when God wants to show up like he showed up this morning with his presence. I, I think that, that, that he was demonstrating that this is what he wants to be as a norm for us, not, not, not you know something that shows up every six months or so. When the presence of God hit the temple, of uh, Solomon's temple, the Bible says that they couldn't even stand because, you know, what would happen? I want you to think about that. What would happen if the presence of God came into this place so thick and so heavy that we couldn't even stand? I'm telling you that many, many would be afraid of the presence of God. They would run from the presence of God. And God wants us to run into the presence of God. He wants, because it's in his, it's in his manifest presence that, that the miracles take place. You know what? The anointing's great. The anointing draws us in. The Bible says that it's the, it's the anointing of God that draws us into the, to the presence of God. The anointing of God helps us preach better. The anointing of God helps us sing better. But listen, if we just settle for the anointing, we'll never experience the presence of God. Amen. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27 says, It shall come to pass in that day, that the burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck. And the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing. So I, Isaiah tells us that it's the anointing that breaks the yoke. It's the anointing this morning. The anointing of the Holy Spirit that comes in, that sets the table, that sets it up for God to, to begin to show up. But so often what happens is, is, is we stop at the anointing when, when God says, listen, I want, I want you to hang out with me. Amen. There's probably... Several reasons why we do it. I mean, if we're just being honest, sometimes we, we, we stop at the anointing and, 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 and don't go on in is because we want to control the service. We want to stay in control. We want to know that, listen, at 1030, we're getting out of here. We, we don't know at 10, you know, I'd be Kauai because at 11 o'clock I'm supposed to be eating lunch at somebody's house. And so, and so you know what, God, I, I, listen, I'm, I'm coming to church and I love you. But listen, at 1030, I'm, I'm leaving. I got to go. I got an appointment. And so if you take over, then you know what, you're going to mess up my schedule, God. So, so we settle for the anointing because we have, to, we have to beat, you know, the Baptist church to the restaurant. God, and this is what God says, okay, all right, all right. I, listen, I, I wanted to show up this morning, but, man, have a great lunch. Maybe, maybe we can connect next week. I'm not talking to you much during the week because you don't invite me over. We set up for the anointing sometimes because we have sin in our lives. And, man, I'll tell you what, the anointing of the Holy Spirit convicts us things that we've been saying the things we've been doing the things that we've been looking at and and we're convicted by it and we should be convicted by it because the that's the, that's the job of the holy spirit is to convict us and and so we're convicted by it and because we're convicted by it we say god listen i i, I just can't stay here and so i i really don't want your presence to show up Sometimes we stop at the anointing because we fear the unknown. We, have, we, we fear that the Holy Spirit actually will begin to manifest himself like he did in, in, in the, the, the early church. And, you know, and we, we read about that, and, and that, that makes us uncomfortable. And so, and so we just, you know, I'll have $2 worth of God. I have $2. I just, you know, not, not enough to change my life, just enough to make me feel like I've been to church. I have $2 worth of God, please. Can we be real this morning? Yeah. 
We stop at the outer courts when God wants us to come into his presence. I've shared about this guy before. I'm going to share about him again today. But this guy that, that had discovered that there really was a difference between the anointing of God and the presence of God. We know that the Ark of the Covenant, the manifest presence of God in the Old Testament, you know, when the Ark moved, it was God moving. God was, you know, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant was, a, was the golden box that contained the, the, the Ten Commandments that, that, that God gave to Moses. And, and inside that, that Ark, there was the, the rod, that, uh, the almond rod that, that budded while it was disconnected from a tree from, that belonged to Aaron. And, and inside that inside that. That box, there was a jar of manna that God had made provision for the children of Israel when they were coming through the, through the wilderness. And that was all contained inside that. And so, and so they protected the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was the manifest presence of God. And, and during the, the reign of, of King Saul, as we, as we read through the, the, the scriptures, that King, King Saul had the opportunity to have the manifest presence of God in, in, his, in his kingdom, but he didn't have it. He allowed it to be somewhere else. For 20 years, King Saul was the king for 40 years, and for 20 years, the last 20 years of, of, his, of his reign, he, King Saul lived on a second-hand revelation instead of a first-hand revelation. He didn't have the presence of God with him. The, the Ark of the Covenant was not, even, was not even in Jerusalem. It wasn't even around him. The Bible says that because of Saul's disobedience, because he didn't do what Samuel told him that God wanted him to do, the Bible says that the kingdom of God was removed from Saul and God appointed David to be the new king. And now David becomes king. And the first thing that David wants to do, because David loved God and loved the presence of God, and David was a worshiper, David said, you know what? I want the presence of God here with me. And so he said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to bring that Ark of the Covenant back here. And so that kind of, we picked a story up there because the Ark of the Covenant was at a man's house by the name of Abinadab, and, and I'm not going to get into how it got there, but it, you know, the Philistines had basically stolen the Ark of the Covenant in a battle. They'd stolen it, and, and then because God put, put curses on them and plagues on them, they sent the Ark of the Covenant back, and so it ends up at this man's house by the name of Abinadab. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was supposed to be taken care of by people who were called Levites. They were the helpers for the priests, and they, their job, their calling, their gifting in ministry was to take care of the Ark of the Covenant, to take care of the temple, and, and Abinadab was not a Levite. And so they made a mistake there even putting the, the Ark of the Covenant at Abinadab's house, but, but they, the Bible says that they consecrated Eleazar, his son, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Then the men of Kareth Jerem came and took the Ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill, and they consecrated Eleazar, his son, to keep, to keep the Ark of the Lord. And so at least they commissioned somebody to take care of the Ark of the, the Ark of the Lord. Now we know that they weren't supposed to touch it. Actually, they weren't even supposed to be looking at it because it was the, the presence of God. Normally it, 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 it was behind a veil in the Holy of Holies, but here it is sitting at the house of Benadab. Second, First Samuel chapter 7, verse 2, it says, The ark remained at Kerajim a long time. It was there 20 years. How long? 20 years. And all the house of Israel named it after the Lord. Now, uh, I, I, I'm thinking that the, the ark of the covenant was at Abinadab's house, probably sitting in the corner of the room somewhere. They knew they weren't supposed to touch it. They weren't supposed to mess with it. But I think it became just kind of like a piece of furniture in the room. Here, here they had the actual, they had the manifest presence of God sitting in their living room. And they didn't, they didn't recognize it, didn't do anything with it. We, I, I, we know that Abinadab had at least three sons, Eleazar, and he had two other sons called Uzzah and another one named Ohio, which we'll talk about them in a few minutes. But for 20 years, this, this ark sat in the room just like an old piece of furniture. We had, we had 
a buffet. When I was growing up, we had this big wooden buffet. It was a, a buffet like with a china cabinet thing, you know, only you'd put, I guess you put, if you had china, we didn't have good china. We had, we had no more plastic plates. But we had, my dad bought this dining room set one time, the table and the chairs all ended up breaking, but the buffet, it was, you know, it, it matched it, but, and it somehow made it through. It was solid walnut. It weighed about 40,000 pounds. We hated moving, we moved, and we moved all the time, but we hated moving it because it weighed so much. But the buffet, you know, what we did, we put old bills and stuff in it. It wasn't nothing special. It just, this sat in the room, and, and, you know, nobody even looked at it until it was time to move again, and then we had to move the buffet. And I, and I think that, that the Ark of the Covenant actually became like that buffet, that, that old antique piece of furniture that, that, you know, that a lot of times we have that piece of furniture in our house. It's there. Maybe it was, a, you know, an heirloom. Maybe it was handed down, and, and so it has some value to you. But maybe it's just something that you have, and we've always had it. We don't want to throw it away. And so it sits there, and, and that's what the Ark of the Covenant, for 20 years, sat at Abinadab's house, and, and, and nobody messed with it, and nothing happened for 20 years. Saul is removed as the king. David becomes a king, and, and he says this, I want to bring the Ark of the Covenant back. So we pick up the story in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 1. It says, and David, listen to this, and David consulted with the captains and the thousands and, and the hundreds and with every leader. Who did he leave out? He's talking about bringing the Ark of the Covenant back, so he, he, gets, he has a meeting. He has a staff meeting. He, he consulted with the captains of the thousands and the hundreds and with every leader. Who did he leave out? He never asked God, which is going to cause him a problem. Listen, sometimes, sometimes we have a good idea, but it might not be a God idea. Sometimes we do things and we never ask God, should I do this or should I go there or should I be involved in this? We don't, we don't talk about that. David said to all the assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you and it's of the Lord, let us send out to our brethren everywhere who are left in the land, uh, the land of Israel and with them the priests and the Levites who are in the cities in their common lands that, we, that, that they may gather to us and let us bring the ark of, our, of our God back to us for we have not inquired of it since the days of Saul. So, so since the days of Saul, the ark of the covenant was, you know, they didn't have the presence of God is really what he's saying. Verse four, then all the assembly said, they would do so for the same seemed right in all the eyes of the people. So David gathered Israel together from Shihar and Egypt as far as the entrance to Hamath to, to, to bring the ark of God from Kareth Jerem. And, and, and David and all of Israel went to Balal and Kareth Jerem, which belonged to Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God uh, of the Lord who dwells between the cherubim where his name is proclaimed. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart. From the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ohio drove the cart. Now, we know that Uzzah and Ohio uh, uh, were Ahio, Ah 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 or whatever his name is. Uh, they, they were sons of Abinadab. And, and we, even like we talked about a couple weeks ago when we were talking about Hosea, names have a meaning. Names have meaning. Now, now and it's no coincidence, I think, in this case, because the name of Uzzah means this, strength, operating in my strength. That's what it means. And, and his brother, Ahio, or whatever it is, his name is this. It means I am friendly. I have a personality. So, so we have strength and personality. Come on, this is going to tie into what happens in churches. We have strength and personality moving the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Bible says that David built a new cart, and that new, that new cart was going to be a fancy cart. He, it, he, why? Because he wanted God to be honored. But, but what, what he failed to do is he, he failed to, to talk to God about how he should move this, this Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was not supposed to be moved on a, on a new cart. It wasn't supposed to be moved on a cart at all. And so, you know, David has this big production planned, and, they, and we're going to read that in a few minutes. He's got cymbals and harps and music and, and trombones and... and, and and flutes and lyres and, and guitars and all this music that, 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 because there's going to be a big production because, because strength and friendly are going to deliver. It's going to deliver the Ark of the Covenant in this big production and everybody's going to be happy and we're going to worship the Lord. And the Lord says this. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
was a fancy cart. And I'm sure that David thought, you know, the cart would honor the Lord. But you know what? God never wanted a cart to ride on. He, he wanted people to live in. He, he wanted his presence, come on, to be carried by people, not by an instrument. Verse 8 says, David and all of Israel played music before God with all their might and with singing and harps and string instruments and tambourines and cymbals and with trumpets. And, and when, when they came to, to Shidon's threshing floor, Uzzah, what does his name mean? Uzzah? Strength. Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark because the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah and he struck him basically killed him because his hand had touched the ark and he died before the Lord. Why do you think the oxen stumbled? I I think that the the oxen stumbled because God placed a bump in the road and the reason he placed a bump in the road was he was trying to get their attention because what they were doing was wrong. It wasn't wrong for them to want the presence of God. It was right for them to want the presence of God. So so their, their, their motive... Their motive in bringing the presence of God back to them was right, but their method was wrong. Listen, God still cares about how we do things. You know, he cares that we get stuff done, but he cares about how we do things as well. So our motive and our method have to match up. And so David's motive was right, he, you know, in bringing the Ark of the Covenant back, but his method, it was not supposed to be transported, you know, on a cart. It was supposed to be transported on, on, by, the, by, these peace, by, by these priests, and so... And so, you know, God places a bump in the road. Listen, God places bumps in our road as well. You know, sometimes you're going along and you're married. How many are married? How many ever had a bump in the road in your marriage? Okay, we've got the right crowd. Don't be, don't be slapping each other too hard. You think, where did this come from? Man, you know what? Just yesterday we were getting along fine, and now we're fighting with each other. Where, you know what? I, I liked you yesterday. I'm not liking you too much today. Where did that bump in the road come? Listen, God puts bumps in our road to get our attention because, you know what, maybe we're not treating each other the way we're supposed to be treating each other. And so God goes, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me, you know what, I'm, I, I've told you how you're supposed to treat each other and you're not doing that, and so I place a bump in the road. Sometimes he places a bump in the road with our kids. Come on, you know, your kids are doing pretty good, and then all of a sudden, can I just say it, they start acting like idiots. And you think, man, they were good kids yesterday. What, what, where, where did these devil kids come from? You know? Well, God placed a bump in the road. You know what? Because something wasn't right. He's trying to get our attention. Like, something's not right in our family. Maybe, our, maybe the, the dad's not being the priest of the home, or the mom's not submitting to the loving leadership of the dad. And so the kids are seeing that, and they're, and they're getting all confused. And so God says, listen, I'm going to place a bump in your road because i got to get your attention. Sometimes God places a bump in the road in our finances. You know, our money's good. Everything's good. We quit paying our tithes, and all of a sudden we're broke. And like, what happened here? And God says, listen, I, I told you how you can be blessed. I told you how I would rebuke the devourer for your sake. I told you how I'd open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings on you that you couldn't even contain. But, oh, no, you want to do it your own way. Okay, try it your own way. Go ahead. I'll put a bump in your road. When, when you come to your senses and you realize that you should be paying your tithes, and I'm not taking an offering right now. Don't worry. Actually, we quit taking offerings, and our offerings have gone up. There's a box in the back. That's a, that's a testimony of the Lord. There's a box in the back. We don't stand up here and tell you everything we need. God knows what we need, and he's providing that. And uh, so anyway, that's, so there's a bump in the road. In your finances, God's trying to get your attention. David's motive was good, but his method was wrong. So God was getting his attention. Verse 11 says, David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Ezra. Ezra was laying there dead. Therefore, the place is called, listen to this, Perez Uzzah to this day. Perez means this. It means a broken covenant or a broken law. David named this place Perez Uzzah, meaning this, in my own strength, I've broken God's law. That was no coincidence that you know, God was trying to get their attention. David was afraid and said, how can I bring the ark of God to me? 
So David would not move the ark into the city of David, but he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom for three months. How long? Three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom. Let's see if this one says the same thing. And, and all. See that? All that he had. All that he had. So, if, if Obed-Edom was a farmer, which I'm, I'm thinking right now it, he probably was, and I'll point out that why I think that in a minute. O, 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 Obed-Edom's corn is twice as tall as everybody else. People look at Obed-Edom's corn, everybody's a little corn here. and what's, what's going on with your corn, man? What kind of fertilizer are you using? Well, yeah, I don't know. The Lord's just blessing me. Obed-Edom's wife liked him better during these three months. Obed-Edom's kids liked him better during these three months. The Bible says that God blessed all, everything that Obed-Edom had for these three months. Oh, everything that he had. Now, this morning when I was studying this out, the Lord brought to my attention in verse 13, it says he, you know, he, that, that David moved the Ark of the Covenant into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. Now, I, I looked up Gittite, and it means Philistine. That, so it means this, Obed-Edom the Philistine. God would not place the Ark of the Covenant with the Philistine. And so I'm thinking, God, why, it, why did you call Obed-Edom the Philistine? And here's why. Uh, scholars say that Obed-Edom was a Levite. Da- David, placed, David placed the Ark of the Covenant with a Levite. That's what, the Obed-Edom was a Levite. His heritage, his gifting, his calling was a Levite. But called him a Gittite because he wasn't living according to his calling. He, he wasn't being a Levite. He was probably being a farmer. So here he is on the outskirts of town farming when he was supposed to be doing something for God. And, and here he is operating on the outside of his gifting, the outside of his calling. How many know that you get confused? You know what? You get frustrated. You know what? You don't know what you're doing. You get angry when you're outside of your gifting and you're trying to do something for, for God or do something for somebody else. I thought this morning, well, maybe God just called him that because that's how he was acting. Because he was not a Philistine, he was a Levite. What was the difference between Obed-Edom's house, where the Ark of the Covenant was there for three months, and God blessed everything he had, and, and the, the Ark being at Abinadab's house, where it was there for 20 years, and nothing happened? What was the difference? The difference, I think, was this was that Obed-Edom recognized what it was that he had. He recognized, listen, you know what? In my lineage, I'm a Levite. In my lineage, our families have taken care of this thing. This is the Ark of the Covenant. This is the actual presence of God. He probably got his kids around the Ark of the Covenant and said, listen, don't touch it. You can't touch it, but you, you can look at it. You don't know how blessed we are. Let me tell you the history of this thing. You know what? This, 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 this box right here went with all of our, our ancestors through the, through, the, through the wilderness. And for 40 years, it was out there. And all the miracles inside this thing, you know, is, is, a, is the Ten Commandments that Moses had. And we can't touch it. We can't look at it. Look inside of it, but listen, we are blessed. We are blessed. And so I think the difference between Abinadab and Obed-Edom was this, was they reverenced and recognized the presence of God. And when you do that, God shows up and he blesses everything that you have. This changed Obed-Edom. It changed the way that he acted. It changed the way that he responded. It, it, it actually probably reminded him of his calling, reminded him of what God had placed him here on this earth for. So the Bible says that the ark stayed there with Obed-Edom for three months, and God blessed him, blessed everything he had. See, I think that we can learn something here from Obed. We can learn this, that when you get to the place that you're not satisfied with just the anointing, God will show up. But if you come here on Sunday morning and you say, you know what, God, just give me $2 worth, please. Got to go, got an appointment, gonna, gonna, we're going to go surfing today. We're going to the beach, you know, we're all going to be there. I know that's why I come to the early service, God, because I know he's got to be done by 1030 because another service is coming. I got this timed out. <laughs> don't, don't think I don't know what you're thinking.
when we get to the place that we say, God, I appreciate the anointing, need the anointing. But I want your presence in my life. I want your presence in my home. I want your presence on my kids. I want your presence on my family. I want your presence on my finances, God. I want your glory to fill my home, to fill the temple in my house. I want your presence to be with me every single day, God. Appreciate the anointing, love the anointing, but God, I want to go in. I want to go past. I want to go past that veil. I want to go past that curtain, and I want to be in your presence, Lord, every single day. I'm telling you, I, without a shadow of a doubt, God is looking for people that will do that. So David goes back during those three months, and he figures out that, that they were not supposed to move that cart, or that, the ark on the cart, that he figures out that they were supposed to move the ark on these wooden poles because nobody was supposed to touch it. The priest could carry the ark on these wooden poles that had rings on the side of the ark so they could lift it and carry it. And that's the way they carried it through the wilderness. And it was God's plan that they would, they would carry it on. from. That's why Uzzah died is because in his own strength, he tried to stable, he tried to stable the, you know, the, 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 the ark because the oxen had stumbled. But you know what? Listen, God, if he was strong enough to protect that ark during 40 years of the wilderness, he could protect it on this cart ride. So David figures this out, and he goes, he goes back to the house of Obed-Edom, the Bible says, and, and he's going to go get the, the Ark of the Covenant. But this time, he, he brings the priests and the Levites, and he understands how they're supposed to transport it. Chapter 15 of First Chronicles says that as they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant back, this one guy, Obed-Edom, continued to show up. You know, David, I, I'm sure he called for, put the word out that, th that, that they needed volunteers. They needed somebody that, that could help in these different areas. And just like in church, we put the word out many times. We need people to, to help in these different areas, and people come and volunteer, and we, we appreciate that. I'm sure that David did the same thing here as they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant back. You know, David says, I, I would like... People that play musical instruments to, to play musical instruments as we're bringing the Ark of the Covenant back. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 16 says, Then David spoke to the leaders of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be singers accompanied by instruments of music and string instruments and harps and cymbals. So they had the whole band. They had the band together. And he said, listen, as we're bringing the Ark of the Covenant back, I want the band to be playing. I want God to be, to be praised and stuff. And so, and so I, you know, get you, get you some, some guys together, and, and I want you to bring them together. Now, how I know that Obed-Edom was a Levite, he said to gather together the leaders of the Levites, and I want you to look in verse 18, who volunteers? Obed-Edom. He couldn't have done it if he wasn't a Levite. Does that make sense? So, Obed-Edom probably goes to David and says, listen, you know, hey, they, they stored that at my house for the last three months, David, and I really appreciate it. And, and I was just wondering, can, can I ask a favor? And David said, what, what's, your, what's your favor? Well, you know, I play the guitar a little bit. I'm not very good. I play the guitar. But, I, I, you know, I heard that you're looking for some Levites to play some music, and if you don't mind, I'd like to play the guitar. David thought, well, you know what, you watched the, the Ark of the Covenant in your house there for three months? Yeah, go ahead, you can play the guitar. And so, thanks. And so, now Obed-Edom's a guitar player around the Ark of the Covenant. He's really happy about it. A little while later, you know, David realizes that, you know what, the Philistines had stolen this Ark of the Covenant before, and he didn't want it to ever be stolen again. And so, and so he, he tells his leaders, he said, listen, we need to find some doorkeepers, some, some bodyguards, basically, to watch the Ark of the Covenant, because I don't ever want it to be st stolen again. And so they put the word out that, that they need some, some doorkeepers, some guys that will just be around the Ark of the Covenant, make sure that nothing funky happens to it, and, and, you know, and don't let nobody touch it. We, just, we need, we need some, some doorkeepers that will do that. And so they put the word out, and, and you'll never guess who volunteers. First Chronicles chapter 15, verse 24, a list of names of the people who volunteered, and there, almost to the end, is... Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom says, hey, David, you know, I play the guitar a little bit. I told you about that. You know, I'm not very good. You probably heard. 
But I tell you, I can whoop some guys. I, I'm, I'm being a farmer, right? You know what? I'm strong. And, and so if anybody comes and tries to mess with the Ark of the Covenant while I'm around, they're going to have trouble because I'll whoop them, David. I'm telling you. And David's like, well, you're a little weird, but I'll let you, you know, if you want to be a doorkeeper, go ahead and you can. And, and he says, oh, no, no, get, you get two for one with me, Dave. No charge. I'll play the guitar. I'll sing and stuff. And I'll watch the Ark of the Covenant. I'll beat people up. I, I, I'm the guy. I'm your guy, Dave. And Dave says, all right. No, I keep him away from me. But he, he's a little strange. Ill William's a little strange. A little while later, David's looking at the Ark of the Covenant, and he says, man, this is, this is the presence of God. We have the presence of God with us, and God wants to be praised. And, and so he calls his leaders together, and he said, you need to orchestrate some praisers, some people who know how to worship God, some people who will raise their hands, some people who will call out to God, some people who will love God, some people who will stay around the Ark of the Covenant 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I want God to be praised because I love God, and I'm a worshiper, and I want people worshiping God. And so he says, go find me some praisers. You're never going to guess who volunteers. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 4, it says, And he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the, the Lord and to commemorate, to thanks, and to praise the Lord God of Israel. And verse 5, And asked for the chief priest, and next to him, uh, Zechariah. And he goes down, and look, look who shows up. obed -Edom. David, you know, I volunteered for some of my other jobs. You know that. And David said, yeah. He said, I play the guitar a little bit, and I, I can beat people up, but I tell you what, I, I can worship God with the best of them, David. If you don't mind, if you don't mind, three for one for David with me, David. I'll tell you what, I'll play the guitar here. I'm not that good, but I'll beat people up, and, you know, and I'll worship God at the same time. You've got nothing to worry about with me around this thing, David. You know what, I'm going to take care of this thing. And so, and so, David, would you mind, would you mind if, I, if I just hung out here? And you know, when you're looking at this, you think, you know what? I got this guy's number figured out. You know what? Every job that he applied for, everything that he wanted to do was an upfront job. It was a job on the stage. You, you look at this thing and say, you know what? Obed Edom was a glory hound. He just wanted to be in the limelight. That's what he wanted to do. You know what? To be, a, to be a, 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 up here on the band and play the guitar, that's on the stage. And, you know, to be a, a, a doorkeeper and a bodyguard, that, he had to be up front. That was, on, that was on the stage. And to be a worshiper, that was on the stage. That's, that's what his deal was. He was filled with pride. He was, you know, he was just a glory hound. So that's why he did that. Until you keep reading. Because a little while later, David's walking around inside the temple and he sees some cobwebs and some dust. And he says, you know, guys, I don't know if you recognize this or not, but this is the presence of God that we have here. And this place is filthy. Now, I want you to put a word out, put a post out there somewhere that we're looking for some people that will come and clean this temple. You know, we have people that come here on Thursdays. You never see them. You never hear from them. And they vacuum and, and they dust and they, and they clean the surfaces of stuff and they clean the bathrooms and they dump the trash and you never see them. You never hear from them. But God sees them. God hears from them. David says, I need you to find some people that, I know it's going to be kind of hard, you know, because not everybody wants a job like that because, you know, nobody sees them. There's no honor in it, no glory in it. You know, you don't get pats on the back. But this is the presence of God we have here. We got to have somebody that will clean this place up. They put the word out. You, I guess you guess. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 37, so... He left Ashford and his brothers before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to minister before the Ark in its regularly, everyday work that was required. So just keeping the place up. And look who volunteers, not only Obed-Edom, but 68 of his brothers. 68 of his brethren. He had an influence on some people, too. So it wasn't just about being up front. 
something happened to Obed-Edom. David probably calls him in and says, listen, come in. I want to talk to you. Sit down. Obed-Edom comes in, sits down. David says, look, I did notice that when we needed people that would play instruments, you volunteered. We need people that would be bodyguards, you volunteered. We need people that would be praisers, you volunteered. And even when we needed people just to come in and clean the house up, you volunteered. Now, Obed-Edom, there's, some, there's, something, there's something here that you're... That I'm missing. I, I don't understand. I've never seen anybody like you. I've never seen anybody that that you know that would be so motivated to 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 be around the Ark of the Covenant. What what's the deal? So Obed Edom says, "Listen, Dave, I got to level with you. Eight hundred and fifty years ago, my grandpa." His name was Esau. He traded the presence of the Lord for a bowl of beans. David, for three months, I've had the opportunity to feel what it was. Because it was supposed to be Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But it ended up Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because my grandpa traded away the presence of God for a bowl of beans. And David, for the last three months, I've had the opportunity to feel what it felt like to have the presence of God. And I don't ever want to lose it again. So if you don't mind, I'll just clean up around here. What do we trade for the presence of God in our lives because he wants to show up just like he did here, just like he did in Solomon's temple. He wants to show up here on Sunday morning, but listen, he wants to show up in your bedroom on Monday morning. He wants to show up in your kitchen table there on Tuesday. See, he, he wants to show up. The presence of God doesn't just happen in the church house. He wants to happen in your house. It wants to happen in your car. It wants to happen on your job. That, that you walk around with the presence and the glory of God on your life. That you glow. That when people see you, they see there's something different about you. And when they don't know what it is, and when they ask you, you know, what is there that's different about you than me? The only difference is this, is I have the presence of God in my life. And you can have the presence of God, too, if you'll just pray with me right now. You know what? We'll see the presence of God come into you. See, Obed-Edom recognized that. He recognized what it was like to have the presence of God. He never wanted to lose it again. And so often I think what happens is, is we trade it away. We get outside our gifting. Listen, every gift, every gift that we need in this church is sitting here today. Because God said he's placed each one in the body just as he's chosen. And he's gifted each one. So every gift, every Every uh, office of ministry is here today. God's placed them here. But so often what happens is we don't recognize our gift. We don't recognize our office. We don't recognize our calling. And so what we do is we sit and we wait for somebody else to do it. And then we get frustrated. And, and, and a lot of times we leave churches because, you know what, I'm just not getting fed there. When in reality, God was saying, listen, why don't you walk into what I've called you to do? And you're going to find fulfillment and satisfaction. And you're going to be happy and you're going to have joy in your life. Why? Because you're in my presence on a daily basis. I'm telling you that as a church, if that's not what you want, this is not your church. It's not the church for you. Because I'm telling you what Pastor Christy and I are believing for is this. is the presence of God to be here all the time. To be here all the time. That when we walk in, listen, when a visitor walks in, there's a residue on the people here that they recognize, man, there's something different here. And you know what? The only difference between us and other people is this, is that we abide in the presence of God, that we invite the presence and the glory of God to come into our services and to live with us in our homes, that it's not just a Sunday thing, that it's a seven-day-a-week thing. Because, listen, one day we're going to go to heaven, and that's where we will live. We will live in the unadulterated presence of God for all eternity. And so this is just dress rehearsal. It's dress rehearsal. Some people are going to be shocked when you get to heaven because they didn't even, never, never actually experienced the presence of God. 
You know, they, they got born again, and, 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 and you could be born again. It, the presence of God is a choice. You can get born again and, and, and go to heaven, but not live in his glory here. And that's what he wants. He wants to manifest himself in us. And, it's, you know, we want miracles. We want people to see. We want uh, Pastor Marty to be healed of cancer. You know what? Pastor Marty's going to be healed of cancer in the presence of God. He's not here today. That's where he usually sits. In the presence of God. Cindy came in this morning and said, you know, she had her, her, her leg hurt. from uh, she, she fell down. We prayed. We prayed right there on the spot. You know why? Because in the presence of God, he heals legs. In the presence of God, you know, arthritis has to crumble and die. That's, that's what happens in the presence of God. You know, because as it is in heaven... It's supposed to be on earth. Well, there's no arthritis and cancer, and, and there's none of that stuff in heaven. So God wants that here, too. That it's, it's, we're practicing here. We're practicing. What I want is the presence of God in my life, in Christy's life, in your life. But we have to hunger for that. I, I think sometimes... Our motive's right, but our method's wrong. Like David's motive was right, but his method was wrong. Our motive, we want the presence of God, but sometimes our method's wrong. We, we're trying to go about it in a way that, that God doesn't recognize. You know, he's, he, he can't show up in that way. That's why he couldn't show up on that cart. He, he did show up on the cart, but not in a good way. We don't want him to show up that way. You don't want him to come in and start cleaning the house. So we have, to, we have to evaluate, God, what I do and why I do it. Why, why do I do that? I want my motive. I, you know, in, in 2 Chronicles 7 there, first Chronicles, where he said, if I had humble myself and pray and seek his face, turn from my wicked ways, that he'd hear, he'd hear me from heaven and he would forgive me of my sin and he would heal my land. So humility is the path that we take into the presence of God. That's got to be our method and our motive. Not for us, but for him. And when he's glorified, the Bible says he draws all people unto him. You know, when I... I I don't care if we ever have a thousand people in this church. I don't care. I've been in churches with that kind of people, and I honestly would rather not have it because you lose connection with people. I was saved in a church of 80 people. I'm, you're connected to those people, and it's good that it would grow, but you know what? When you have the presence of God, you can't stop it from growing. You can't stop it. And so as long as our method and our motive is right, you know what, God, we, we, we not only feel this, build 10 more buildings like this. Because people are attracted to the presence of God. But it takes us as people, you know, I was reading through this yesterday and talking with Christy, and, and I wrote this down, and I think it's right, I think it is, that today you're the Ark of the Covenant because you carry the presence of God. You carry the presence of God. So you bring the presence of God in here. That's why when two or three of us get together, God has the ability to break loose. Why? Because we have the presence of God coming here. Would you guys come? You know, Harlan, would you come? I don't know... Uh, that, that song that we that Harlan you sang what was it that one you just sang yeah, sing it again can you do that it's a song that we sang during worship time uh, come as you are you know what that's all God asks he didn't ask that you get cleaned up and he, he, you know what he'll clean you up he just asked that you would come. Come as you are. We come into his presence saying, God, you know what? I, 
Sometimes I come into God's presence, I don't even know what I need. I just know that I need God's presence. And so to close our service today, this is what I want to do. I, I, I told you what I'm looking for and I'm expecting and I'm wanting to do. I'm too old to play games. Which I know I look young. I know that. But I, I'm too old. I'm too old to play games with God or people. When, when we come together, we need to come together and, and bring your presence of God. And I'm going to bring my presence of God. And we're going to have the presence of God in our service. So, you know what, and as we come as we are, that means that, you know what, I might have messed up this week. I, I, I you know, sinned in my mind or sinned with my mouth or, or, or did something wrong. You know what, and God's able to cleanse you and forgive you of that if I will come to him and humble myself in his presence. And, and so that's what it takes is us saying, God, I, you know, forgive me, God, I messed up this week. And he says, I know I saw you. Forgive me, Lord. He says, all right, I'm. Take your sin and remove it as far as east is from the west and not remember it anymore. How about that? I'm just glad that you're here with me in your presence, in my presence. As they're singing, I, I, I don't want to coerce you or try to twist your arm. But I do believe that God's watching today. And he's looking for hearts that are saying, God, use me. God, send me. God, use the gift that you've given me. If that's you as, as we're singing that, I, I want you just to, just to get up and come to the front, and we're just going to pray, and that's how we're going to close our service today. Go ahead, guys. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted. Come on. Let rescue begin. Come find your mercy. O oh, sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow yes. that heaven can heal. Yes. So lay down your burden. Hallelujah, Lord. Lay down your shame. God, we lay it down here today. All who are broken. Come, God. Lift up your face. Thank you, Lord. Oh, come. Move through this place, God. Move through this place. You're not too far. So lay down your hurt. Lay down your heart. Come as you are. Sit at your table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure. Thank you, Lord. So lay down your burden. Lay down your shame. Holy Spirit, come. Who are broken? Lift up your faith. Oh, wonder, come home. You're not too far. Thank you, Lord. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart. Come as you are.
Lord, we come before you today, and Lord, and you see our hearts and our minds, God, and our spirit, Lord, and we're not playing games, God. Lord, we, know, we want you to move. Lord, we want you to fill this temple, God. Fill our temples, God. Fill us, God, with your spirit, God. Fill us with your presence, God. Lord, let your glory abide in us, God, that when we come together, Lord, corporately, Lord, there'll be a glory in this house, God, Lord, that will shine in Hilo, Father God, in Jesus' name. Lord, that lost people would be drawn to your presence, God. They'll be drawn into your light, God. Those, Lord, that are in bondage, God, to sin, God, would have it broken, Lord, because of the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit, Father God. Lord, we come and we ask, Lord, that you'll touch us, God. Renew our hearts and our minds, God. Give us hunger for your word, God. Give us hunger for your gifting, God. Give us hunger for who we are in the body of Christ as you've placed us here, God. Lord, and help us, Lord, to be about your business, Lord, here in this city, God. Lord, we believe that Hilo will be saved. Lord, you desire for Hilo to be saved, God. Lord, we want to be a part of that, God. Use us, God, in Jesus' name. Fill these individuals today, God, with your presence, God. When they leave today, God, Lord, don't leave them, God. Lord, walk with them in their, in their presence, God. Lord, walk with them in their home, in their car, in their job, God, in their schools, God. Lord, let your presence abide on us, God. Help us, God. Help us, God, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, as we're in this atmosphere right now, I just... If you're a believer and you're here today just ask God how does this apply to me how does this apply to me how does this apply in my heart in my life right now and he'll show you he'll show you what you know what needs to change or maybe he'll just you know encourage you that you are exactly where you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to be doing but just be open to what God's telling you so I want you just to ask the Lord right there in your own, in, in, in your own way. Just ask Him, God, what, how does what I just heard here apply to me? Is there anything in my life that, that's hindering? And Lord, you know what? I, I don't have to point that out. You, you already know. God's already pointed it out. If there's anything that's hindering, any idol, anything that we've placed before Him, any habit that we have that that's breaking communion and fellowship with them. We're dealing with people that, that are living together and not married, you know, and God's blessing's not gonna be on their life. And, and so I, I'm, I'm meeting with people and, and, and seeing that they get married to have the blessing of God on their life because corporately that affects us as a body. When we have... We have blatant sin in our lives. I, I want you to come because it's in, it's in God's presence that he'll deal with that. But let him deal with that. Any habit that needs to be broken, let him help you with that and deliver you from that. You know, because it's the anointing of the Holy Spirit, like we talked about, that breaks the yokes of bondage. That, that's, that's his business. That's what he does. And he'll do it if we allow him to do it. So when we come in, we want to come in with clean hands and clean hearts. Clean hands and clean hearts. You know, the Bible says that Job was a blameless man. It doesn't mean he was a sinless man. Blameless means that he walked in integrity, that he was beyond, he was honest with God. If there was anything in his life that wasn't right, he was honest with God. God helped me with that. And that's why God says that he was a blameless man. He was an upright man in all his ways. And that's what God's looking for. He's looking for that in us. Man, I, I want to see God move in our city and and, and, and move across the island. That revival that we've been praying for and believing for. Man, I'm telling you, he is so for that. He's so excited about that. He, he wants to manifest himself. And he's saying, come on, just get some things right so I can show up. So as you're researching your heart out right now, I want to talk to another group. You, you may be here and, and you say, Tom, none of this makes sense to me. I, I don't understand this presence of God stuff and this anointing stuff. I don't understand that. And that's okay. I'm glad that you're here. And let me explain why you don't understand it. The Bible says that before we come to Christ, that there's blinders on our eyes and blinders on our heart. And we don't understand the Bible. We don't understand God's word because these blinders are there. 
But when we come to the place that we ask Christ who died for our sins and God raised from the dead, when he asked him to come into our life, the Bible says that the blinders are removed and all of a sudden the word of God makes sense. And all of a sudden when I pray, I know that God hears me. Even though, you know what, maybe my life's not all perfect and all, which none of our lives are. If, you, if you've not come to that place that, or, or you know what, maybe you, you have come to that place and, and you walked away from God. And, and today, God says, come as you are. Come on, come on back. Come on back and let me reestablish my relationship with you. The Bible says that the angels in heaven rejoice, rejoice over one person. And you know how many people on a Sunday and around the world get saved on a Sunday? They receive Christ on a Sunday? That them angels are busy all the time. Because it's God's plan of redemption to redeem us. Write our names in the Lamb's Book of Life that when we do die, that we stand before him and he says that we can enter in not because we were good people or bad people, but because we belong to him. We became his children by believing in him. If you're here today and you say, Tom, I've never really prayed that prayer or I prayed it and I've walked away from God and I'd like to pray that prayer and ask Christ to come back into my life. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I'm going to pray for you today. Pray for you right where you're sitting or standing. If there's anybody in here in the presence of God. I'm looking. Thanks. Anybody else? Okay, let's let's just pray. Let's pray with our brother here. He, he's, he's prayed this prayer before. And you know, sometimes sometimes we sometimes the enemy attacks us and makes us think that we're not saved when we've asked Christ to come in our life. And he does that to keep us from growing. Because if I never really settle it in my, eye, in my heart that I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, then I never get past the initial salvation, even though God still saves me, right? And so let's pray that. And we're going to pray just to make sure, because there may be some people here that, that didn't raise your hand, but you need, to, you need to pray this prayer. And even though you didn't raise, it's not raising your hand that gets you into heaven. It's, it's raising your heart. Raising your heart to God and saying, God, change my heart. Let's just pray out loud and say, say, Jesus, thank you for your presence. Today, I ask that you'll fill me with the Holy Spirit. Forgive me of my sins. I, I repent for every sin that I've ever committed. I'm sorry. Please blot my sins out. And today, make my relationship with you fresh and brand new. I receive you as Lord and Savior of my life. Let your presence abide in me. Thank you for saving me. And thank you for saving me, God. In Jesus' name. When you leave today, you don't leave the presence of God. No. Listen, he, He's going with you. And so let Him manifest. I appreciate, I appreciate you coming, and I appreciate you being open and honest with God today. And let's just see if your week doesn't go better this week with God. I guess we have some announcements. <laughs> Praise God. It feels good to worship together. Is, is your mic on? Is your mic on? Yes. Can you hear me? All right. Praise God. Just want to welcome you this morning. Um, if you want to meet our pastors, if you're new, just came to worship together in the back. Pastor Tom and Pastor Chris will be at back there. Pastor Clint and Pastor Vicky will be at back there. You can meet our pastors and our staff this morning. Also, we have announcements. I can look in um, the bulletin also. Yep. Well, have a good week. Take God's presence with you. God bless, and the offering bucket's in the back so you can drop it on the way out. Thank, have a blessed week.